video lecture. Um, here we are with uh, cross elasticity of demand. Uh, it's very similar to uh, price elasticity of demand, but it's a little bit different. Um, and so we're going to go over this concept with you today. Um, let's look at our learning goals and see what we need to know by the end of this video lecture. One, uh, we need to be able to define cross elasticity of demand. Sometimes it's referred to as XED, um, or you know, instead of writing out cross elasticity of demand, you can just abbreviate with XED, which makes it you know simpler and quicker. Um, and in defining XED, you also need to know how to um, you know the formula. So uh, you'll you'll get a mathematical formula that also um, explains how to calculate XED. And one thing to note too is the reason why I didn't you know write both formula and define is often these two are interchangeable. Um, like in an IV test, um, if you were asked to define XED uh, on a paper two test, if you wrote the definition, that would be great. If you wrote the formula, uh, in many cases, you would also get full marks um, depending on the particular question. So be able to define it, know um, how to calculate XED based on a data set. So you'll get some numbers and you'll need to know how to calculate it. And then you also need to know what do those values mean? How do I interpret the values associated with the um, cross elasticity of demand? And we'll be going over that shortly. Um, finally, um, we will look at why it is important to know or uh, why it would be useful for firms to know XED um, and also um, what are some problems associated with XED? Why might uh, calculating XED be a little bit unreliable? So we will be going over that. All right, let's get right into it with XED or cross elasticity of demand. Here we go. Um, it's very similar to the definition of price elasticity of demand but um, with just a one little slight change. Um, it is uh, a measurement of responsiveness of a change in quantity demand did of good X due to a change in price of good Y. So basically what cross elasticity of demand is looking at is um, if the price of one good goes up or down, how does that impact the quantity demanded for another good? Um, and technically even though it says where you know the responsiveness of quantity demanded of another good. The thing is, is that um, we're actually looking at how much demand changes for for a different good um, in response to uh, the price change of a related good. So maybe you recall from supply and demand. Uh, there's the supply and demand unit uh, not that long ago that um, if the price of a you know of a substitute good. For example, like an Xbox One and a PS4, if the price of an Xbox One uh, goes up, then the Xbox, Xbox One get more expensive, the quantity demanded drops for the Xbox One. Um, consequently, uh, people will be buying, you know, not only less Xbox Ones, but there will actually be a shift of the demand curve for PS4s, for the substitute good. And what we're kind of looking at with cross elasticity of demand is how much of a shift will we get? How um, how good of a substitutes are PS4s and Xbox Ones or whatever two goods we're comparing? The whole point of cross elasticity of demand is to tell us, um, look at how closely two goods are related. So that's kind of the point of it. The formula is almost the same as PED, um, except for you've noticed maybe that instead of PED, which is percentage change in QD over percentage change in P, We've got XED, percentage change in QD of good B uh, over percentage change in price of good A. So we're looking at how two goods are related. Hopefully you've written down the formula and the definition, um, and you'll definitely want to write down these next two points as well because they're very important um, for understanding the values that you get once you do calculate uh, XED. And that is that if goods are negative, if you, or sorry, if you calculate XED and you get a negative number, then we know that those goods are complements, meaning that they're goods that are often purchased together. If you calculate XED and then you find that uh, the value is positive, then we know that those goods are substitutes. And we'll add a little bit more depth to that in a moment. But please note that negative complements, positive substitutes, and if you ever get zero, um, those goods are unrelated. All right, so let's go a little bit more in depth on that formula real quick. Um, 
if, if, you know, here's the formula here, percentage change in QD of good B over percentage change in price of A. If you weren't given the percentages, you could figure out XCD based on a data set. So for example, if the price of one good went up, then you would put in the new price minus the old price over the old price, and that would give you the percentage change as a decimal. Uh, and then you could just shift it over two points or times it by 100, and so that would give you the percentage change. Uh, and then you would look at how that impacted the quantity demanded of another good, um, the other good that you're seeing how, how they're related, um, by looking at the new quantity minus the old over the old times 100. So it's, it's almost the same formula for PED, um, but just with one slight variation with, with, you can see, with goods A and goods B. So this formula... If you're given the percentages, then just put the two percentages on top of each other. And uh, if you don't get, or if you're not given the percentages and you're just given prices and quantities, then use this formula, which is literally the same thing as this. It's just um, you know uh, to figure out the percentages. Um, another thing to note too is a moment ago we just mentioned that if you ever get a positive value, we know that it, the goods are substitutes. If you get a negative value, less than zero. Um, it's their complements. So when when looking at uh, that, one other thing to note too is that, like we said, if you get a zero, you know that goods are unrelated. If you get a positive, they're substitutes. If the number is fairly close to zero or it's pretty low, like if it's 0.2, um, you know, if you get a 0.2, then you know that the substitutes are not very good substitutes. Um, there are things that people don't really buy in place of each other. Same with uh, complements. If you get something that's pretty close to zero, they're pretty poor complements, meaning they're things that people probably don't often buy together. Um, but a good example of this might be in uh, Europe, you know, uh, people often put mayonnaise with their French fries, where in America they often put ketchup. You know, maybe in Europe, um, you know, if the price of French fries, um, you know, frozen French fries at the supermarket, um, went down and people bought more french fries, you'd assume that people would probably buy, you know, in, at least in, in Europe, they buy more mayo and probably not more ketchup. So if you were seeing how ketchup and, and maybe uh, french fries, frozen french fries were related, you would see that in Europe you get a very low value or a value very close to zero, meaning that they're not very complementary. Whereas if you get a much larger um, you know, like if you got negative two or negative four or negative five, um, you know, when calculating uh, how the the XED for a good, two goods are, um, you'd know that they're more complementary. They're more, uh, you know, better goods that uh, better go together or often purchased together. So just note that with this spectrum and how um, goods are related. All right, so let's give you a real world example of kind of what this looks like. Um, we'll take two complementary goods, tennis balls and tennis rackets. Um, obviously, the, usually these goods are purchased together, um, but not always. Um, but let's go ahead and take a look and say, for example, that for whatever reason, the supply curve uh, for tennis rackets shifts to the right. Maybe input price, prices are cheaper, like the carbon fiber used in the rackets gets cheaper. And if that happens, then we're going to see a supply shift to the right. And as you can see, the price of tennis rackets dropped. So they're cheaper, and now people are buying more of them. So previously it was 250 and 400, um, 4,000 rackets rather, and now it's 200, you know, dollars a racket, and people are buying 7,000 rackets. So um, we noticed that the price of one good dropped, and people are buying a larger quantity of that good. The movement along the demand curve because of a shift in the supply curve. But the thing is, we're with XED, we're looking at how these goods are related. So um, we're going to go ahead and now take a look at the market for tennis balls. Um, and as you just saw, because they're related goods, the price of the rackets went down. Now the whole demand curve for tennis balls has gone to the right. And we can see that we have a new equilibrium price and quantity. And so um, because of the price drop in one market, we're seeing a much higher quantity demanded and quantity sold uh, in a related good market. So what I want you to do now is, uh, and we're going to do this together in just a second, but 
Why don't you see if you can't figure this out? We've got the change in price. We said it dropped, rackets dropped from 250 to 200. And then we also said that, um, that tennis balls, people were buying 7 million. Now they're buying 10 million. So um, what's, you know, if we could use those numbers, we could figure out the XED um, for uh, how tennis balls and tennis rackets. Why don't you pause the video and see if you can do it um, and you know, take a moment, go ahead and pause and try it. All right, did you do it? Hopefully you got it. Let's take a look at the worked math problem or the worked answer solution. Um, you should have, I didn't write out all the zeros, but we said that the new amount of quantity demanded for tennis balls was 10 million was 7 million, so 10 minus 7, so new minus old over old, times 100, and then we've got uh, the new price of rackets. Um, they were 200, they are, sorry, they are 200 now, they used to be 250, so new minus old over old. So we've got our formula here, and if we were to figure out the percentage change, we would see that it's a 42.86% change in uh, quantity, uh, due to a 20% drop in price. And when we do this problem, we're going to get negative 2.14. Do you remember from just a moment ago, when we calculate XED, what does a negative number mean? Well, if you, if you were paying attention, you would know that they are complements. So negative values indicate complements. And it's greater than 1, so it, it does look like you know, there is some sort of relationship there. It's not an amazingly good relationship, but it's pretty good. Um, it's, you know, so we can see that they are complementary goods. All right. So that's one example of how we would calculate XED. Let's do one more. Um, and this time we're not going to do, um, you know, complements. We'll do substitutes. Let's say that um, for whatever reason, the price of hot dogs drops. Maybe the price of pork uh, or, you know, Schwein in German uh, gets cheaper, which is a key ingredient in hot dogs. Um, that would cause the supply curve to shift to the right and the price of hot dogs to drop, as you can see, from 150 to 1. Also, now people are purchasing more hot dogs. They were purchasing 40 at that 150 price, but now they're purchasing 70. So more hot dogs are being purchased. Um, but that's going to have implications on the market for hamburgers. Now, what do you think will happen uh, because of the price drop in the hot dog market what happened to the market for hamburgers? Um, and I bet you probably can already, you've already figured it out because you're smart cookies or hardworking smart cookies. Um, at least I think most of my students are. Um, we will see that, you know, because they are substitutes, the demand for the substitute good will drop. And so we've got previous price of $2.50 uh, per burger and 100 burgers, but now the price has dropped to 2 bucks or $2.00 and half as many hamburgers are being purchased. So we've um, got a big drop in the number of burgers sold. Um, so we could figure out now, based on this, the XED. Why don't you take a moment, and we know that the change in price, uh, we saw that hot dogs were 150 and then they dropped to a buck. And we also saw that burgers changed uh, from 100 burgers to 50 burgers. Um, why don't you calculate the XED, see if you can't do that, pause the video, and um, if, uh, if you got it, uh, we'll move forward. So um, go ahead, pause, and uh, work the problem. All right, are you done? Great. So worked math problem. Let's take a look at the answer. We saw that there was now 50 burgers purchased. Used to be 100, so new minus old over old. And obviously, you can probably figure that out. It's going to be a 50% change in the amount of burgers you know, consumed. And then we can see that the new price of the hot dog was 1. It used to be 1.5, so 1 minus 1.5 over 1.5. And hopefully, you came up with there was you know, negative 50% or 50% decrease in the price of hot dogs and a 33.3% um, decrease in the uh, the price of or the uh, sorry the price of the hot dogs and a 50% decrease in the quantity of burgers um, when you do that you should get about 1.5 um, so if you think about it uh, 
what does a positive value indicate? Um, if you get, you know, a positive value. Well, if you remember, that a, means it's a substitute good. So, um, and it looks like, you know, it's greater than one. These goods are probably pretty decent substitutes. They're not perfect substitutes. Um, just because hot dogs, you know, um, got cheaper doesn't mean that many less people buy burgers, but apparently there was an impact on the market. All right. So now we're going to do um, a little bit more practice, but this time I'm going to kind of let you, I'm going to have you do um, these two uh, word, these two, um, these two problems, um, sample problems on your own. And so, you know, answer this one on the decrease in the price of um, belts. And we'll look at the impact on the, or sorry, the in decrease in the price of suspenders uh, and what will, you know, happen to belts and see what the XCD is. And then here we've got iPods and Zunes and Apple raising the price on iPod, iPads, pods rather. What happens to the market for Zunes? Go ahead and calculate these two uh, word problems. And then when you're done, go ahead and give this a shot. See what, um, based on what we know of XCD, um, what, you know, and those values, what can you conclude about the calculations um, of these two goods? All right, so go ahead and pause the video, figure it out, and then we'll go over the answers. All right, I assume you're done. So let's go ahead and said, uh, you know, we've, we see that uh, suspenders dropped in price and um, belts, uh, there are fewer belts sold. Let's find the XCD for those and the iPods and the Zunes. Uh, you should have gotten negative 25% uh, change in quantity of belts because of the negative 20% drop in the price of suspenders. And so you should have gotten 1.25 as the XCD. And then with iPod and Zune, um, we see that, you know, the price of the iPod went up um, and the quantity demanded for the uh, Zune also went up, um, but we got a smaller value. So what are the two things that you can conclude based on this data? Well, hopefully one, that you realize they're both substitute goods um, as they both have positive values. But you can tell that two of these goods are closer substitutes uh, than the other, the other, the other two, and uh, hopefully you could see that belts and suspenders has a larger value, uh, and so they're mo more, they're closer substitutes than iPods and Zunes. Apparently, the increase in price of iPods did not motivate people to buy more Zunes. Uh, Zunes don't even exist anymore. I doubt many of you know even know what a Zoon is, but uh, anyway. And uh, just a kind of a worked example. All right, let's move on and let's talk about the value and problems associated with cross elasticity of demand. What, why do firms want to calculate XCD? Why would you want to know how, you know, how complements and substitutes prices are impacting your good? Well, for one, it can help you anticipate changes in the market and anticipate if, you know, for example, a competitor drops their price. How will this impact the amount of revenue and, and profit your firm uh, generates uh, based on the, the changes in the price of your substitute uh, good? So that's, that's important to know. It's important to know how much uh, also your good is related to other goods in terms of complements as well. Like if you drop the price of, of your good, will you sell more complement goods um, that you also make? So it's, it's important for firms to understand the revenue um, that they will earn based on changes in the market um, and changes on prices of goods from other firms that maybe people buy um, in conjunction with their products or also with substitute goods. So just note that. It helps you understand changes in the market and revenue and profit. Next, um, a lot of firms use XCD to you know, develop strategies. Um, and we'll talk about two such strategies um, one of them is called loss leader. Loss leader is where you lose money on one good so you can make money on another. And a good example of a loss leader strategy might be ink and printers. Um, Canon and Kodiak and or Kodak, sorry, and uh, you know HP, all are companies that make printers. They also sell the ink for the printers, and they you know could see that the you know the cross elasticity of demand for these these goods are. Uh, they're very strong complements, and so 
maybe they decided that they would make uh, more money on the ink and less money on the printer and drop the price of the printers to you know uh, to to make more money on the ink because you know you have to keep buying the ink but you only buy the printer once so um, it can help companies devise strategies such as a loss leader strategy finally um, it might help companies and firms decide uh, also about um, making movements in terms of uh, mergers and acquisitions and buying other companies or merging with other companies um, you know we have an old phrase in in America and in Britain if you can't beat them join them um, companies that that uh, are competing against each other sometimes they purchase each other and maybe they purchase the substitute good that another company makes uh, that competes with theirs and by you know buying that company out um, uh, they, you know, they will reduce the competition. But maybe they, you know, from learning about XED and learning how um, close of a substitute good is to their good, uh, they realize um, it might be beneficial for them to know the the XED because of how uh, how much market share it would give them and how the market would respond uh, if they purchased a, another firm. Anyway, so this is just a couple of examples of why you would want to know XED. But there's also some problems, and um, we'll kind of go over that. They're kind of, it's in a way, these two problems are the same. Um, they're just kind of different ways of looking at the same problem. But one of them is that the market is constantly changing. Um, a moment ago, I gave you the example of printers and ink with a loss leader strategy. And, you know, maybe printing companies calculate that the XED for printers and ink is very, very strong, and that um, you know, that they're very strong complements. But um, there are other things happening within the world of, of, um, of, of, of printing, computing, and, and whatnot, and that people are using less paper. It's just, you know, people, schools, and governments, and, and uh, even at-home users are just generally using less paper. And so um, maybe also using less ink because um, those goods are also complements. So uh, other markets, other there are changes that happen, and this causes uh, can can make XED a little bit misleading, you know. And also, kind of in the same light, um, there are also sometimes extenuating circumstances that firms don't think about. Um, and an extenuating just means uh, additional uh, kind of circumstances that are kind of not foreseen or you just didn't know about um, that you didn't know was a part of the problem. So, for example. Um, taste and preferences, um, or demographic changes. You know, a moment ago we gave the example of the uh, the belts and the suspenders. Um, you know, maybe in the 1950s when a lot of people wore suspenders, um, this this made more of a difference um, because it was in fashion to wear both belts or suspenders. But um, and maybe they had a uh, they were uh, st uh, stronger substitutes back then, but. Over time, fashion changes and um, the XED value would change, but you might not know from maybe one year to the next, maybe the XED uh, you thought was strong and then it just suddenly changed because something fell out of fashion. So anyway, um, that's, the, uh, that's the lesson on XED. I hope you know the definition. I hope you know how to calculate it. And I hope that you know what those values mean uh, when you get a positive or a negative value. Thanks for listening, and good luck uh, to my economic students. All right, we'll see you soon. Bye.